peoples and welcome or welcome back to another video. Today I'm going to be walking you through how four of my favorite animated shows use time to really make their stories feel epic. And I'm also dressed as one of those characters so let me know in the comments if you know who I am for Halloween. Hello, editing Ash here to say you know that funny feeling when um you're editing a video two to three weeks after it was supposed to go out and you realize it was supposed to go out on Halloween because you're wearing your Halloween costume, but it's actually going out in about like mid-November. <laughs> That's what's happening here. But it's here now, so um, enjoy and- Before we get into this video, I want to give you a major, major spoiler warning for Gravity Falls, The Owl House, Star vs. the Forces of Evil, and Amphibia, which I will be breaking down major plot points from all of them in today's video. So uh, definitely, definitely do not watch this video if you don't want to be spoiled for that. But just because you can't watch this video doesn't mean that you can't subscribe to my channel and check out my other video which covers similar topics from last week which talked all about visions, foreshadowing, and flashbacks. If you do not mind being spoiled for those shows or you've already watched them because they're amazing, then continue watching and welcome into the video. And if you want to watch them and do not want to be spoiled, they can all be found on Disney+. Plus. I can't access my notes with these gloves, so one moment. Ah, uh, yes. First thing I'm going to be talking about, the first show, is Gravity Falls. I love this show. It's the first of these four that I got into. I sort of view them as all in the same category of what kind of TV show they are, so that's why I'm breaking them all down in the same video, because I liked very similar things about them. So Gravity Falls I wanted to use as the perfect example of my favorite rule for writing, know the end before you begin, aka the awesome use of foreshadowing. Gravity Falls starts out pretty monster of the week initially. The Pines twins go to stay in Oregon at the mystery shack with their grunkle, their grand, their great uncle, their grunkle. They discover a journal in the woods that has all sorts of supernatural creatures talked about in it. They do not know who wrote the journal and they do not know why these creatures suddenly exist but only here in Gravity Falls, Oregon. And so the mystery begins. It is slowly revealed throughout the series. Here's where the spoilers come in, that the journal was actually written by their other Grunkle, who is the twin brother of the Grunkle they are staying with. So Stan and Ford. Ford wrote the journal, Stan accidentally got him sent to another dimension and is trying to rebuild a portal to bring him back. Little do they know that once Stan builds this portal, Bill is the major antagonist of the series, he is going to be able to take over Earth. So this is a pretty epic plot line, I'd say, but what the show does so great is that it sprinkles hints of this throughout the entire series. We do not know until way on in season two of Gravity Falls, which is the final season, there's only two, that Ford and Bill worked together to make the portal before Bill betrayed Ford. But since day one, since the design of the mystery shack, they've been setting that up. If you look at the windows, they look like a Bill. If you look in the journal, it talks about Bill, it talks about being betrayed. We can see all these signs that were being set up from the beginning. And this is why it's so important to know the end before you begin. Because if you know the end point, then you can start setting it up from the beginning. This is a huge part of what makes the mystery in Gravity Falls so rewarding when it is finally revealed. You get to watch the setup from the beginning without knowing it was set up. You just think it's a funny design for a shack and it's cool. Little do you know, it's like a major plot point. You get to see in, I think it's episode two, that we are introduced to Fiddleford McGucket, who seems to just be another of the neat characters that's gonna pop in and out of the story. But then later on in the series, we get to discover just how integral to the plot he is. Since day one, this series has been setting up a huge mystery and a huge reveal. and honestly it's stuck to me one because of good characters and funny dialogue and just good writing and design and in general but what made it a great show was the payout for the mystery and it wouldn't be nearly as rewarding if they hadn't been setting it up all along that is why you should watch my video on foreshadowing from last week because foreshadowing is just so cool but legit it is foreshadowing can make your story feel so epic and that's what i love about these kids cartoons technically they are kids cartoons but 
they can appeal to pretty much any audience, I feel like. They're well written and the foreshadowing makes them feel so epic. By the time that you hit the finales or even just like the final season, everything has so much weight to it. Every action matters and that's because they're really masterful at setting everything up leading up to this. That brings me to um, possibly my favorite out of all of these. Okay, Gravity Falls is amazing and I will love it forever, but I'm a sucker for villains and especially villain redemption arcs. So The Owl House. The Owl House is amazing. I just watched it as you may be able to tell. That's a hint if you didn't know what show I was from. But yes, The Owl House is amazing and I'm going to specifically talk about its villain and villain redemption in this one because there's so many amazing things about all these shows that I'm just going to use each one as an example of a specific thing. We are first introduced to the world of The Owl House when Luce the human accidentally ends up on the Boiling Isles, which is another dimension with, uh, you know, demons and witches and magic and all that stuff. Instantly, Luce wants to become a witch. And to do that, she has to do a favor for Ida the Owl Lady, which introduces the idea that if you're different, you end up in jail here. Ida practices wild magic, which is what she teaches to Luce eventually, but most other characters in the series have coven sigils, which is a mark on their arm, which makes it so that they can only use one kind of magic and one kind of magic only. This is a interesting plot device and world building thing from the get-go, but as we get further into the plot, we realize just how integral it is. All of this control is put in place by Emperor Belos, the big bad of the series. Now here's where it gets interesting. Belos at first just seems like, I am evil. And I was like, okay, you're a cool, you've got a cool design and you're the villain. But as the series progresses, we see signs that something is not right with Belos. He has not complete control over his physical form. He needs to feed off of magic. Here's where like the major, major plot spoilers come in. And then we begin to hear about Philip Wittebane, another human from long ago who came here just like Luce did. The way that they set up slowly showing you that Bellos and Wittebane are the same person is masterful. We get to watch Luce slowly realize that she, in helping Philip, helped the villain. And that is a wonderful twist for her character. You want to help everybody? You want to be the good character that's always the star of these sorts of shows? Well, it didn't work out for you this time, did it? It's a great plot twist and it's just steadily setting up the fact that this villain has a backstory. Now, if you're interested in how to write good villains with cool backstories that make them the people they are today, check out this video. I will link it up above. Now, my personal favorite character from that series is Hunter. Hunter is Bellos' right-hand man in the series. He's his nephew. But we slowly get to see that Bellos' plans for Hunter are not as innocent as first set up. And we get to watch Hunter slowly realize that he doesn't want what he thought he wanted and that this person who he thought was his family isn't the family he wants to be a part of anymore. And the way that they do this slowly over the series is really good. We only meet Hunter in season two. So the fact that they're setting him up and they're able to create a fulfilling redemption arc in just one season is really impressive. The Owl House was meant to have four seasons, but it got canceled after two because I guess it just didn't fit with the Disney brand. That's as far as I could find out. So they ended up having to have three specials for season three instead of the full four seasons that they wanted. They still tie it all up with a bow and um, thanks to them, the first special of those three is masterful. So you should still totally watch the show. It's not like it leaves off on a cliffhanger or anything, but just the way that they take his character and they set him up from I'm a cool character but I'm evil to I'm like Ash's favorite character and I have one of the most amazing redemption arcs ever is it's pretty cool. The Owl House using Bellos and his past and sprinkling in hints and foreshadowing through that is a great way to make your villain feel more sinister. If your villain pops up one day and it's just like, I'm here and I'm evil now, you're like, okay, that's a villain. But if you set them up in scene after scene after scene, in hint after hint after hint, then you will steadily 
create this truly epic feeling character that when they're in a scene, you're like, stuff's about to go down. Next, I'm going to be talking about Amphibia, which I also just finished. I just started rewatching all these shows. I love them so much. I'm actually currently still in the middle of watching Star vs. the Force of Evil, but we'll get into that show later. Right now, we're just talking about Amphibia. Amphibia has some of the greatest character evolution I've seen. All shows and movies, pretty much, at their heart are like, we're gonna show you a character who starts out flawed and ends up being a better person. But not every show and movie actually does that. And a lot of them just say that they did that. Amphibia actually does it. When we first meet Anvu and Choi, when she ends up in the mystical frog land of Amphibia, she's pretty selfish and she doesn't really understand what friendship is supposed to be like. She just sort of thinks about herself, is susceptible to being a pushover. She's a very flawed character and initially I honestly didn't really like her. However, this was cool to me. I met her and I was like, you're very flawed and I don't think I really like you. But then got excited it because usually when I meet characters in animated shows that are the heroes, especially the protagonist, they're like perfect and then by the end they're perfecter. But this character was severely flawed so I knew that she was going to have an actually good setup and become a better person by the end. And it's exactly what happened. Throughout the course of the series she learns to think about other people first. She learns to stand up for herself. She learns to be confident in herself and be more responsible and mature and all of these things that cartoon characters are usually meant to become as they progress through the story. But she does it so noticeably that the character that we first meet in episode one and the character that we meet in the final episode, I would not, I don't recognize them. They're different people. And that was really impressive and cool to me. This show does have some foreshadowing for sure. And I feel like a really cool villain final moments. But I've already talked about that with the last one. So I'm going to be talking about character evolution for this one. The amount of episodes that they were given, I think Amphibia had three seasons? They were able to take their time and actually truly show this character's slow evolution. They show her trying, failing, trying, failing, trying, succeeding, trying, failing, trying, succeeding, until eventually she just slowly evolves. The same thing goes for her friend Sasha Waybright. Sasha starts out the story in our eyes as Anne's best friend who she misses and is probably a good person. But then when we meet her, we realize she is not a very good person. She's manipulative and controlling and clearly a little bit of a bully. However, by the end of the series, she is none of those things. And it's really amazing to see that evolution because I think that a lot of times shows try to do it, but they mostly just say they're doing it, whereas this show shows you they're doing it. It's the classic show don't tell. For example, one of my favorite things with Sasha was that she is being controlling and manipulative and who has now evolved a little bit and is no longer such a pushover, stands up to her and is like, I don't think we should be friends anymore. Sasha gets upset about this, but also angry at Anne. She's not just instantly remorseful and wants to change. It's more of a natural, realistic evolution. At first, she acts like she's changed, but she hasn't really. And then they end up in a fight and she says something that a lot of people I feel like would say, I don't want to change. I'm happy with who I am. That moment really stood out to me because in a lot of shows, I feel like, especially kids shows, the character would have been flawed. Someone would have pointed out the flaw and be like, I'll change. This character did not want to change, which is more like human beings in the real world. But eventually throughout the series, she realizes that what she's doing is actually wrong. And she decides that she does want to try and change, but it takes some pretty drastic measures and moments to make her decide to change. In the end, she's helping other people to change and she wants to better other people the way that she had to learn to better herself. But it took her time to get there and it took effort. And I really appreciated that as someone who watches a lot of these shows and sees perfect characters become perfecter to see a really flawed sort of bad character become a good person realistically and over time. So if you want your character to evolve and change and have a character arc, which is the backbone of a lot of stories, really think about how they might fight that change in the beginning. They don't necessarily want to become what other people want them to be. They might be happy with themselves, especially if their problem is that they're a little bit of a bully or if they're self-righteous or if they're overly confident or something along those lines. If they're insecure, then they probably want to become confident, but they struggle with it. If they're overly confident, then they don't want to backslide. So they're probably going to fight until they finally realize that they do need to change. Gloves coming off one last time. 
Star versus the Forces of Evil. We're gonna be talking about love. So Star versus the Forces of Evil does all of the things that I've been talking about. It has character evolution, it has mysteries and foreshadowing, it has villains that they take their time setting up. It's a very good show. I really like it and um, I need to finish watching the last two seasons. Haven't done that yet, but I'm getting there. I'm almost done and I have watched it before so I um, can still talk about it like this. And we're gonna be talking about the friends to lovers romance, the slow burn. Now this romance I feel like is done really well. A lot of times girl meets boy, they fall in love, end of story. This series is long enough they can really drag it out. Star meets Marco. They sort of get on each other's nerves at first, but throughout the first season, we get to watch them become best friends. I liked how at first they did actually sort of annoy each other. Well, it was mostly Star annoying Marco, but they both grew to become the best of friends. Then in the next season, Star ends up having a crush on Marco, but Marco is just like, we're friends. So he goes out with someone else. She becomes jealous. Their relationships becomes complicated and eventually she tells him how she feels and leaves. Well, because she has to leave, not because that's what you should do in that scenario. You should probably let them reply to you. She didn't. Um, but then it's not like after she says, here's how I truly feel, it works out. She left, he goes back to his life, but now he's confused. We get to see both of them being confused about their feelings. They are both dating other people by season three, but do they like each other? But do they not? But do they like each other? But do they not? We get to see them waffle back and forth, but never does it get annoying. Yes, we want them to end up together. Yes, we're pretty sure they're gonna end up together, but I'm never like, I wish it would just happen already. I'm like, I'm enjoying watching this slow evolution between them. And that's what I really like about shows like this. They get to take their time. When you are given four seasons of a TV show, you can really plan out everything. And this is where planning, foreshadowing, all of this stuff comes in. The slow build. If you rush into things, it's not going to feel impactful nearly as much as if you take your time and slowly, slowly, brick by brick, build up to the momentous a moment that you want in your story. In my own series, Project Punk, which is a cyberpunk comic book that I'm working on writing and vlogging the process of writing and trying to get it published, which I will link the playlist up above, I know the end. I know what happens. I know the major plot points. I know the backstories. I know the characters that are gonna fall in love. I know all of the stuff that I need to know. And I'm sprinkling in hints and moments, and I'm trying to build towards it as slowly as these shows do. My story is not a kid-friendly cartoon, but I can still learn from these cartoons how to do slow build well. These shows manage to feel momentous and epic and heartfelt and sometimes heartbreaking and make me cry while also having monster of the week quip-filled, goofy adventures most of the time. One of their episodes could be about breaking of a buff frog statue. Uh-huh. Yes, you heard me correctly. And yet, two episodes later, I could be sobbing my eyes out because of something they've been building to through that goofy episode. I think that as writers, we should absorb content of all types. If we only learn from the sorts of stories that we're trying to write, we will just copy those stories. We will just make more of the things that we're already reading. But if you absorb all sorts of content from cartoons to novels to video games across genres, if you read horror, but then you also read romance and then you watch the Owl House and then you're a Star Wars fan and then you follow that up with some sort of like epic fantasy comic book that's really deep and dark. Take all of those things and you take what you learned from each of them and you put them into something that you're working on. It's going to feel bigger. It's going to feel better. What I took away from these shows is that you need time to make things feel impactful. These shows take their time and they set up their romances, their mysteries, their villains, their character arcs. Everything that they do, they do slowly and purposefully and with planning. They know where they're going and they're taking their time to get there. And I think that you should try and do that in your story too. Whether you're writing a comic book and you can do something episodic, whether you are actually writing a TV show so it is episodes, or if you're writing a movie or a poem. I don't know about a poem. I can't give you tips on poems, sorry. 
or a novel. Try and take your time. Try and know where you're going. If you have a destination and then you take your time to get there, it will feel so much more meaningful. So hopefully this was able to help you out and you were able to learn the things about these shows and learn from them the things that I feel like were super important to realizing how I want to write stories. Let me know if there are any other shows that you feel like I should check out because I'm almost done Star vs. the Forces of Evil and then I don't have any plans for a future show. Also, let me know if you have any characters from these shows that you found really like had good character arcs or anything that you'd like me to maybe break down. I did some character arc breakdowns in my writing villains video and I really liked doing that. If I'd watched The Owl House, by the time that I was doing that, I would have put Hunter in there. I hadn't yet, so it's just Dragon Prince and Avatar, which are both also like amazing shows. I need to do more stuff about those, but I think Dragon Prince should probably finish its full series before I do a breakdown of the family villain dynamics and that again, because family villain dynamics are just amazing. Anyway, I'm rambling, I am hungry, I'm going to go eat lunch, so happy writing. Don't forget to subscribe if you haven't yet, and I will see you in the next video.